thank you everyone for joining in this morning. It's a beautiful sunny morning. And thanks to Denise and to Karen for setting this up for us. Um, I'm Trish Murphy. I'm a director in the Inishon Rivers Trust. And the trust are really excited about the, the prospects of what was going to come out of this eco car and project. Uh, we'll be putting together the Biodiversity Action Plan with the help of Ingus as Denise Blair. And it'll be really great to see actions then happen on the ground in Carandana. So watch this space really. So um, uh, Angus is, I'm going to be interviewing Angus here and Angus has a presentation for us today. Now Angus is, many of you will probably know him, he's a nature guide with Nature Northwest and you may have been on one of his walks or talks. Um, you may have seen him through the schools, he works for the green schools as well. Um, or you may have heard him on radio uh, as well because he has a slot on Highland. So he's everywhere, he's ubiquitous, <laughs> just like our hedgerows are. So um, when we were thinking about doing this, um, I took the chance to look up the word hedge on Google. And something I didn't know myself was that the word hedge is actually has a root in lots of different languages in Europe. So German, Old English and Dutch, and the word means enclosure. So we know that we use hedges as enclosures all the time as boundary markers, but they've obviously have a much wider role in that. And so I'm gonna hand you over to Angus and we'll chat later about that. Thank you, Angus. Thanks a little, Trish. Okay, I'm going to start sharing the um, presentation. So hopefully you'll all see this here okay now. And we'll hit play. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so yeah, hedgerows and how they support wildlife. You could talk about hedgerows for a long time. They do so many different things. They have so many different roles and functions. But we, we've limited time. We're just going to concentrate on a little bit of the wildlife they support uh, and the rest of it. But before we do, and I think before we talk about an awful lot of nature in Ireland, really, it's nice to look at the natural history, um, the natural vegetative history, the natural history of our fauna and flora. Uh, in other words, what was nature like before people started coming along and interfering? And that's relevant because what would nature be like if we all left again? Um, so around about 9,000, 8,000 years ago or so, Ireland was uh, starting to be dominated by oak woods. Before that, trees came in, uh, the pioneering trees, the trees that, that, the tough trees, they came in and started taking over and changing the soil comp uh, composition, like birch and like willow and things like that. But eventually uh, the soil was good enough for oak to take over, for elm in certain places, for ash in certain places. And that's how it stayed for thousands of years. And that's an important context because an awful lot of our plants are really woodland plants, even though we might see them in hedgerows or some of them, sometimes we'll see them underneath uh, bracken and things like that, still sheltering like they would in the woods. And an awful lot of our animals, an awful lot of our, our bugs and insect life, which is the base for, for all the rest of it, um, uh, originate in woods. And then a lot of our bird life, our garden birds in particular, are really woodland species. Uh, if we were in other parts of the world, we'd call them woodland birds, but here we call them garden birds. Um, so it's good to kind of think of that. And if we all left, it's believed, if everybody in Ireland packed up and we said, we've had enough of this and we all headed off, enough of this lovely sunny weather um, and we all disappeared, they think between 50 to 100 years, Ireland would turn back into a forest again. Uh, and the only debate between ecologists is what kind of forest, what influence would invasive species have uh, and whatnot. Because over 90% of Ireland's landmass was forest uh, up until around about 5,000 years ago, the Neolithic period. And when the Neolithic period came in, we started manipulating land uh, in new kind of ways for our own gain, which, which is fine, but it started changing things. Uh -huh. And flashing forwards um, right up until the 1830s. So it's about 200 years ago. It was around about late 1700s, early 1800s. There was actually acts of parliament passed which uh, uh, insisted that people planted hedgerows and they started parceling up their land um, and marking them out with different hedges uh, as kind of boundaries. And if we look at this picture, so this is the OSI map for Carndona and around that area um, from 200 years back. If you look at the picture and especially look at the top of the picture, look at some of those squares and look at some of the, the margins and the field boundaries that are there. The red line, by the way, is the old townland boundary. Um, and we'll look at that now in a second. And then if you compare that picture to um, present day, so I've put it there beside uh, a Google image of, um, from Google Maps of, uh, of what Karen Dunner looks like today. And it's amazing how little 
in some ways has changed. Everything obviously has utterly changed in 200 years. We live such a different kind of life. Where, but the imprint on the land that was put in place 200 or more years ago is still there today. And all of those lines in the 1830s picture um, uh, will, be, will have been hedgerows back then, and they still are to a large extent today. Some of them you can see by the aerial photo, there's only little bits and scraps of trees left, some gone altogether, and plenty of them are still there. I put the orange circle in, and the reason for that is that quite often a town boundary would run along, well it's running along the river there uh, as it's going north, um, but quite often it would run along old um, uh, bits of remnant um, woodland, which would be little bits of ancient woodland that are still left. So they can be particularly interesting and it's a place that'll be interesting to look at. So that orange circle uh, in the 1830s picture shows, um, it corresponds to the orange circle in the present day. And you can see just about the, along the river, you can still see those little bits of that woodland habitat, that riparian habitat, the river habitat is called. But also when the, the red line in the 1830s picture, when it starts heading south, and then east, and you can still see little scraps of woodland potentially that are still part of that. So it could hark back to an incredibly long period um, ago, an incredibly long time ago. So our hedgerows have history. Our hedgerows have been there a long time is the point of all that. And some of them are scraps of how Ireland once upon a time used mm. to look. Okay. And um, so moving on just to the role of the hedge. And there's so many things that hedges do for us. Flood control is hugely important. Um, and it ha hasn't, or it feels like it hasn't rained in about two and a half months. It's quite incredible, really. <laughs> um, but normally we get an awful lot of rain in Donegal, as you know. Inishowen has had uh, its own dramatic flooding um, a couple of years ago. And it's estimated that a one acre field with a fence around it, about 2% of the water that will fall on it uh, will be absorbed by the soil. The rest of it all flows down into the next field or into the ditch or into the school or the town or whatever is below. Whereas if you put, if you have a mature hedge growing around, a managed and mature hedge growing around that one acre field, 48% of that rain is either absorbed by the hedge itself or it's able to drain thanks to the deep roots. So it shows um, as, as flood control, they're hugely important. Carbon sequestering is another thing that is important, and this is something that Chagas are looking into uh, quite deeply at the moment. There isn't a system for being able to work it out accurately, and I think that seems to be the main reason that it's not used um, as kind of carbon offsets for farming. I think that day will probably come, but they do, all trees absorb carbon um, from the carbon dioxide and pass out the oxygen, as you know, it's kind of an incredible process really, turning it into the carbohydrates and hence getting their food from the thin air. Um, but so that carbon sequestering is, is done by hedges, to what extent exactly is kind of hard to calculate, but that's something that's, that we'll, we'll hear more of in the future, I, I'm very sure. As shelter, um, that can be good and bad, they're very useful for, uh, for stock, they're very useful for sound, um, for shelter from sound, that kind of thing. Um, and for general screening, but also then in some places, hedges can cast quite a big shadow and they might need to be managed if the, uh, depending on what has been grown in the field and the rest of it, and to kind of keep that in mind. And then as a barrier, they can be a barrier for various different diseases. They can be a barrier again for sound, a barrier for air. Air quality is, there's an awful lot of talk, thankfully at the moment, some people have been talking about air quality for a very long time. Uh, it's only recently come into the, in the public domain, really only last year. And now with COVID, that's accelerated that. Um, and there's a, there's a huge number of people die every year from poor air quality in Ireland. Uh, and trees help to filter the air, clean the air. Hedgerows do the same with that as well. Folklore heritage. Well, we could see from the last couple of slides how far back it goes. Um, but what we're going to be talking about for the next little while is... Uh, how they're essential for our wildlife, the, the biological diversity and the different living things that live in, uh, in Ireland, in Donegal. And, and that number, I think, speaks for itself. It's kind of incredible, really, over 10,000 kilometres of hedge in Donegal. Um, we were going to do a little poll, I think, at this stage. Um, and the poll was going to be just a quick question asking, um, I wonder, Karen, would you be able to launch that? Oh, there we go, look at that. Uh, so what height do you think hedges should be cut to? Um, how high should they be? Should they be overhead, head height, or below eye line? Um, a lot of our hedges, and we'll, I'll show you some different examples now in a few minutes, a lot of our hedges get cut down terribly low. Um, and, uh, and there's cases for saying that they shouldn't be let fully grow as well. There's a reason for, for that. And also a really important one, how wide should a hedge be? We'll touch on that now in a second. So have a quick 
click on that. Can you see that poll there? Are you able to? Oh yeah, oh, we're getting results coming in there now. Head height. I suppose. And... Yeah, I, mean, I guess another point there would be the type of plant that's growing in the hedge as well, because you know a lot of people like to see a flowering hedge, but it, it depends. You know, is it flowering on the, this year's growth or last year's growth? I mean, that's an issue with what you're planting in the hedge as well, isn't it? it yeah, absolutely. And not everything flowers every year. One of the ways that's recommended for hedgerow maintenance is that they're cut every two to three years and you try and cut one side of a hedge and don't cut the other side until the following year or a couple of years later. So good farm hedge management practice, I suppose, uh, is cutting different hedges on different types of year. So you have different levels of growth and, and uh, as a result, allowing all the different species flower when and, uh, when and if they should. Okay, Angus, uh, we have eight of 11 uh, voted. I'm not <coughs> sure if yourself and uh, Trish, we have nine. Now, um, if yourself and Trish have also voted, uh, Denise and I can't, um, but I think I voted. I voted. <laughs> they're actually so that that might be it. If anybody who um, has the poll or who can't find the poll, and if you're on your phone, if you scroll to the right, uh, you scroll your screen a couple of times to the right, it should pop up. Okay, so we'll end the poll. Um, now, uh, is that okay, Trish? if we end the poll now? Yes, yes, absolutely. Let's results. see the results. Is there anything coming up there? Ah, here we ah go. there we go. Overhead, very good. Okay, so looking at the results, nobody went for below eye line. Good on you all. Uh, head height then. And in some cases, of course, we do need to keep views. Uh, from road safety points of view, we, we certainly need that. Um, uh, in some parts of the road at least, and then also just from a, a scenic aspect or a scenic point of view, uh, and sometimes it's definitely relevant so they don't have to be terribly high, but in general, if they can be left quite high, well, we'll, we'll talk about that now in the next couple of slides. And um, how wide should a hedge be as well? And two meters is the, uh, the, the big resounding choice from you all. We'll talk about that also now in a second uh, in the next couple of slides. We're just gonna look at a couple of different types of hedges. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to move on to the next slide now. Oops. Um, can you see that? Now, um, that is, it, we are lucky in Donegal, the Heritage, uh, Heritage Department of Donegal County Council commissioned a hedgerow survey. And a few counties, but not all counties in Ireland have had a hedgerow survey um, completed. And it's a very in-depth, very comprehensive study um, that these guys did. And so there's a few images from that and a few of the results have come in from that. And this is kind of the ideal hedgerow. So a lot of the plants that are in there are, um, uh, are grown, are kind of grown to their maximum height. Things like the, uh, the white thorn or the hawthorn really as it's called um, and blackthorn, they don't grow terribly tall. They don't grow very big. Occasionally, sometimes you can allow some trees grow a full height. But one of the nice things that's about this is that there's structure in the top, a little bit like if you're studying a woodland, you'd study the canopy layer, which is the top bit you'd study, uh, the shrub layer, the kind of overhead bit, the field layer, which is up to your knees, and then the ground layer, because there's four very different types of, of plants, and then where they'll have their associated bugs and predators and et cetera, that'll grow with them. And you can see that in that hedge. Uh, importantly, the bottom is left, uh, left intact. As when we go on to this, then nearly half of hedges in, um, in Donegal are what they call gappy. And we'll all be familiar with this. So that looks like a nice hawthorn hedge and the hawthorn is all doing well and it seems to be reasonably well managed. However, um, down below, animals have been allowed in, uh, in amongst the hedge. It hasn't been protected. Um, and the recommendations really is that you have two meters. Um, so just as uh, the majority of you said there in the poll, two meters um, around the hedge. But really, if I, I think more, if you could have one and a half meters on either side uh, of the hedge, because you'll still be able to maintain it. Um, but that will allow for a good, decent buffer. Uh, and you'll see that more and more uh, in fairness uh, around here anyway, you'll see a lot of farmers putting fences a little bit out from the hedge to allow that little bit of um, little bit of space and really allowing it to turn into a kind of triangular type structure. As the more that those flowers are down at the bottom, we'll touch on them again uh, shortly, um, the better it is for the overall diversity. 
And it, this is often a common sight. Uh, I can understand the, the want to do it. I can understand the, um, the need for seeing all that light that will come in because of it, or for being able to see the, the views rolling out. However, um, even though that hedge and looking just and you can see in the foreground some of the um, uh, some of the diversity that's in it, it's probably a pretty old hedge. There's quite a lot of different plants in it, uh, and various things will be allowed to grow in the bottom. But uh, you're really limiting how much flowering is going to go on. You're really limiting the sheltering for uh, for juvenile birds. You're limiting the sheltering for nesting birds, and the, just the amount the variety of life that's in it by keeping it trimmed down so low. And um, so really it's better to try and let them grow a bit bigger if it's, if it's at all possible. And then this hedge, which I think looks just gorgeous, but it's starting to grow very scraggly. It's a bit like my own hair now at the moment. It's just, it, it, stay, it has very little maintenance going on. And um, there's a great bottom level to it. However, if, uh, if all the plants are allowed to turn into, and there's, there's quite a lot of trees um, in hedges, if they are all allowed to turn into big mature trees, eventually a lot of the other shrubs will get outshaded by them um, and, the, uh, and the hedge mightn't do as well. Um, so really back to that kind of first thing, you do need to maintain a hedge. Remembering all of Ireland, all of Ireland is manipulated by human hand at some stage. There's not an inch of Ireland that hasn't been um, bashed or smashed or planted or turned or ploughed or whatever to some extent from right up to the hills down to the lowest parts. Um, and hedges are not natural. They're not a natural thing. They're something that we have put in. Uh, so as a result, we need to maintain them and we need to look after them a little bit. Okay, um, just moving on. I might just ask there um, if it's possible, Karen, just to get rid of, to close that poll. It's still up on my screen there. Uh, and if it's not possible, don't worry, I can't close it at the moment. Um, moving on to the plants in uh, hedges. Now the top six, I've just put that list there. Hawthorn or white thorn or may bush, and it's really starting to look good at the moment. It's got those lovely kind of creamy flowers. Um, it's so popular, of course, and it has the thorns, as, uh, so it's great stock proofing. And um, there's all sorts of good reasons for it to be there. And it's native. Gorse, funnily enough, isn't native, although it's naturalized. It's been here, they think, for at least since the Rome or the, the Normans were here, and um, possibly even before. Um, and it, a lot of our a lot of our biodiversity fits in quite well with gorse or the wind bush, um, so it's the second most common plant in Donegal hedges now. This is Donegal holly, ash, willow, blackthorn, all not surprising things, all things you'd expect to see in there, and plenty of them. And it's interesting looking at the trees um, on the the other side there, and you can see the ash is the dominant tree, and this was something that was really worrying people when the ash die back. Um, disease was first starting to come in. It didn't seem to get as hold quite as much as it has in other countries. Ash dieback uh, wiped out 90% of ash in Denmark, 90% of the common ash tree. Um, and if it really managed to whack our ash back, um, it, it, our hedgerows would be in trouble and because they're, they're a hugely important species in there as well. And you can see then some of the other species. Sycamore is also very common. Sycamore spreads and spreads and spreads really quickly. Um, and sycamore is a non-native. It does support a good bit of life. However, it's better to have native things in because they've been here for longer. Our biological diversity um, fits in better with them. Um, okay. Now, only 2% of our hedges had, uh, gel uh, during the survey, had gelder rose in it. It's a native shrub. Um, it's pretty much coming to the end of its flowering now, um, but it's a, a very lovely thing. But if you find gelder rose, it's got very distinctive leaves, and in another few weeks' time, it'll have very distinctive berries. Um, if you find it, you know there's a good chance you're on some pretty old hedgerow, and um, uh, it's, got, it's got very good diversity of species, of native species. So um, it's something that the survey concluded. If you find Gelder Rose, you've got kind of one of the healthiest hedges around. Um, so it's something to watch out for next time you're out for a, out for a little stroll. Okay, to quickly look at the hedgerow understory. It, like so many different things, the same with woodlands, the same with so many, there's different seasons and there's different kind of species that are there. So these two plants that are there are um, woodland species, the primrose that's there and the salandine that's there. They're spring woodland flowers. Uh, however, they're common now all over the place. They do like a little bit of shade and um, so hence they grow so well in ditches and in hedges. They come out early in the spring and that's a strategy a lot of spring flowers have coming out before the canopy of the forest closed. Remember back to the start of the talk, uh, an awful lot of our 
um, diversity is woodland species, really. So these guys still think they're growing in a forest, um, but they're not. They're, they're in a hedge in this case. But when they die back, and already at this stage, or at least when they finish flowering, their leaves are still there, when they finish flowering, um, then the next uh, bunch of species start coming along. At the moment, you can see cow parsley is really taking over. A lot of the rough grasses are really starting to, to thrive. The bush vetch is there. And then as the season rolls on again, other things will start coming up. Meadow sweet and knapweed and, and um, different kind of things. So there's different species at different times, which are all taking over from each other, which is kind of interesting because we, we talk a lot through the pollinator plan about what to plant and where to plant it. And in some ways, it's kind of terribly simple. At least the concept is terribly simple. If you just look to a good, healthy ditch and hedgerow system, and you'll see every season, it's all reseeding itself and it's all um, supporting life right throughout the season. Those celandines and primroses will support the early hoverflies, the early bumblebees, uh, and then some of the early butterflies that come out in the springtime. Um, so now just to briefly look at some of the bugs and hedges and we can't, where do you start and where do you end? But the insect life, bees and um, butterflies and moths and, and hoverflies are four main pollinator groups are getting an awful lot of attention at the moment because they're in such bother. Um, they think that if we don't change our habits and change our ways, 30% of our 21 species of bumblebees, 30% will be gone by 2030. Um, so we really need to try and leave space for this. And this is changing. And you can see the awareness in the last couple of years. It's, it's a huge, uh, huge change and people are getting more and more into it. Donegal last year, Donegal County Council signed up for the pollinator plan, which is a brilliant thing that they've done. Uh, it'll give them guidelines. And it also means there's a certain amount of accountability can be held uh, and less spraying will be used uh, and, and managing the edges. But a lot of that is getting people used to the fact that neat is not always good. <laughs> uh, you don't have to trim everything and spray your lawn to kill the moss and the rest of it to have a successful garden. In fact, what you're really doing is you're stripping out an awful lot of the natural world, an awful lot of the wildlife, uh, which is an awful shame. So you can see that bee there on the bush fetch. There's lots of that bush fetch that's in, in our hedges at the moment. And you can see the lovely speckled wood and uh, butterfly on the nettles. Um, and a couple of the other things that we have, if you go through a patch of nettles um, with a, a net, a sweet net, you'll often find this little nettle weevil. It's a beautiful thing and that picture doesn't really do it, uh, do it justice. It has an iridescent sheen to it. It's an amazing looking little creature. Uh, and then there's a huge variety of other beetles as well. Some of them uh, are predators, keeping the rest of the things in check. Some of them um, are laying their eggs into wood, into old wood, which uh, is not something you want if it's in your shed or in your house. But that's a very natural process and they're helping speed up um, the, uh, the, the recycling, the natural recycling process of breaking down that wood and that wood eventually being turned into, into soil again. The hawthorn fly has probably pretty much finished at this stage, but you might have noticed these over the last couple of weeks. It's also called the St. Mark's Day fly, which is St. Mark's is the end of April, maybe 26th of April or so, I think. Um, so they come out when the hawthorn are starting to flower. Um, they're important pollinators, but they're really important food source because as these guys are coming out in huge numbers and they're very slow. They've got big dangly legs and they seem to kind of hang in the air like a drone. Um, you, can, you can catch them with your hand quite easily, which is unusual for an insect, uh, but birds are able to catch them and gobble them up and feed them to their ever hungry chicks. And then of course we have massive numbers of spiders in the hedgerows as well. This guy, the garden cross spider, is one of the most common. Um, and we're all familiar with that first kind of frosty morning that we wake up to late in the summertime and when there's drifts of, um, uh, drifts of cobwebs in the hedges. And it's often a very beautiful sight. And of course, for every cobweb that's there, these garden cross spiders, they remake their, uh, their web every single day. They eat up the old silk to take back in the nutrients and they remake it again. It's quite incredible, really, the, the work they put in. But every one of those... Uh, we'll have a huge number of, uh, of little baby spiders and an awful lot of those will end up as food for our bird life. And again, it's all supporting that whole round chain. Um, birds in hedges. Uh, Trish, move me on if I'm uh, talking too long about these things. Okay. I've got lost in some of these slides. <laughs> um, but I've put up our two most popular birds. There are two, two most common birds, I should say, not necessarily popular. Um, the wren is the most common. It's estimated to be the most common bird in Ireland, followed closely enough by the robin. Uh, and that's a kind of funny one for people sometimes because we're all used to the robin. Everybody knows what a robin is. Um, whereas a lot of people have never seen or don't think of the wren. 
They have a very loud voice. We've all heard them. We hear them every day at this time of year. You can't help but hear it, even if you don't register it. Those sounds are going into your brain. Um, the wren is a very, very loud, and there's over two million of them around the country. But they skulk, they hide, and they rely hugely on hedges. They build beautiful little moss nests um, that are completely enclosed. They're, they're a gorgeous little thing, about the size of maybe and a two oranges put together. So a tiny little thing, it's kind of stretchy. Uh, it's as cozy as cozy can be, and it has a roof on it. So they're, they're amazing little parents. And when you think of those two million wrens, well, there's more than two million wrens, it's the males that build the nests. And there's, uh, so there's, let's say there's a million males, and they build four to five nests on average each, in the hope to try and get one of them right, at least to impress uh, a female wren. So right now, all around us, there are four to five million of these beautiful little perfect enclosed uh, moss nests in our hedges um, because that, that's, that's ideal habitat for them and we never see them. We don't know they're there and um, they're, they're excellent at hiding. But just to show the role of hedges throughout the year and one of the reasons that it's very important not to go cutting a hedge uh, at the wrong time of year. Uh, and then when we do cut our hedges to try and manage them importantly. So starting in winter, our smallest bird in Ireland, even smaller than the wren, that gorgeous little gold crest there, they need to eat over twice their body weight every day. It's kind of staggering, twice their body weight every day in the winter to put on enough of a fat layer that they can shiver their way through the long night, which goes from five in, uh, at night to nine in the morning. So their, their window for foraging, for eating, of course, is, is um, very short during the winter uh, and food is, uh, is not very plentiful. But if the hedgerows are left and maintained properly, there will be enough food for them. There'll be enough dormant little bugs in there um, and there'll be enough other little bits and bobs. Uh, and same for so many other species that rely on our hedges in the winter for shelter, for warmth and for food. Um, in springtime then, of course, this is appropriate enough, uh, the nest of a, a hedge sparrow or a dunnock. Uh, the dunnock is a little bit like a robin. It has a grey front and they're a gorgeous little bird. Um, and they will nest quite low down, normally kind of waist level or so inside the hedge and have these beautiful little blue um, uh, eggs like that. And you'd think something with the eggs as visible as that, you'd think you'd see them. Again, if a hedge is, well, they won't nest in a very gappy hedge, um, but if the hedge is reasonably full at all, a bit like the wren, they just disappear in there and we don't see them. Um, but there's big numbers of dunnock uh, uh, nesting as we speak and well, pretty much finishing because a little bit like the robin um, feeding its chick and see the way the robin's chick doesn't have the, the red breast as yet. It will by the end of summer, but it's more camouflaged at this time of year. But look out for and listen out for. Uh, this morning already, yesterday again, the day before again, in different places I've been, I uh, heard and saw robin chicks and blue tits and great tit chicks and cold tits, they're, they're very vocal. Um, and they will rely on our hedge, of course, as well. And you'll hear those chicks tweet, tweet, tweeting. And it's a specific little call that you won't hear at any other time of year. Um, so it's a lovely thing to listen out for. And if you can find them, then you'll see them. They'll be bouncing around the tiny little balls of existence, um, uh, flapping away with their wings, begging, begging, begging. And mum and dad will feed them for about two weeks after they've, uh, after they've fledged. So, but, and once that's finished, once those chicks make their own way, well, then all of those birds, um, all of the adult birds, they'll need to replace their feathers. Um, so the, the molt begins and the molt begins, the ideal time for the molt is the end of breeding season, which is kind of midsummer really, July onwards, July and August. And that's why it's a hugely important time to look after our hedges in July and August, because they're full of birds. There's more birds than any other time of year. And they can't fly as well because they're replacing their feathers bit by bit. It takes a few weeks, but they rely on the cover that's there and they rely on the ease and abundance of food that's there. Um, so without that, they're all in trouble. And then, of course, in autumn time, I put up the jay, one of our crows. Uh, the jay plants over 3,000 acorns a year, stashes them really for its, own, for its own winter stash. But of course, a lot of them, it's estimated up to half of those get forgotten uh, and, uh, and that's how oak trees regenerate. But they rely on our hedges too, along with so many other things, those visiting thrushes and so on and so on. But I better move on from birds. Um, just to, did we want to do another quick poll there, Trish? this one um yeah no it's just that you're you're and you're talking there are all these uh, aspects about how important the hedges are for our wildlife um so i just wanted to ask um people who are here today um do they do you think that we should be protecting our hedgerows more so we just have a quick question up there so at the moment um 
we have under the Wildlife Act, it's um, cutting of hedgerows is not permitted between the 1st of March and the 31st of August. But as Angus was saying there, um, there are species um, that, will, that will nest later and there is a lot of activity in the bushes in July and August. And um, there recently, a couple of years ago, there was a, a campaign to try and shorten the season where um, cutting wasn't allowed. And this, luckily enough, was fought back, but there are also campaigns to extend it. So it's really, what do you think? Do you think we should be extending it more? Do you think there should be more legislation around hedgerows and their maintenance? Have we any? The answers are in there now. At this yeah, stage. we have 10. Uh, Great. Share the results. Okay, well, yes. Well, <laughs> well done, everyone. You got that one right. <laughs> 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 no, well, no, that's really interesting to see um, that everybody feels that they should be. Um, I think it's probably very common um, that a lot of people think they should, but um, there are maintenance issues and um, there are other issues like even Angus, you yourself mentioned about the scenic value, um, cutting down a hedge so that people could, you know, view the scenery, um, you know, maybe on a, the Wild Atlantic Way or something like that. So there are lots of issues to consider. But definitely, um, everybody here seems to think that protection, better protection, um, should be done at the moment, yes. Yeah, and it's great to see. It's something that I think is changing very much with uh, environmentalism and, and that kind of thing. We need to bring people along. Uh, and we're starting to hear that more and more now, which is good. <clears throat> it's not black and white, whereas perhaps in years gone by, some of those movements could be more kind of black and white and people mightn't have understood. But people's understanding is increasing the whole time. Um, I, I very clearly from all of this audience understand very well. But in the, in the broader public, people are starting to get it more. But uh, we need to live as well. And that's something that can be kind of forgotten. And that narrative, I think, is hugely important, not just with hedges, but with so many issues around biodiversity, climate change, all the rest of it. The yellow hammer, the reason for putting that up, the yellow hammer is often used um, amongst these kind of campaigns to look after hedges because it's one of the few species that keeps nesting right up into August. In fact, they can even have nests up in, uh, in September time. And you can see the decline of the yellow hammer. That, that's not necessarily all linked to hedges, but hedgerow removal will be a part of that. Um, but a lot of that is the way our land is farm changing uh, from arable, uh, which, which would have suited them much better. There was the corn bunting, um, would have been still in Ireland in the 60s. The big red dot is, is um, confirmed breeding. Basically, that's what that is. Uh, and you can see the last bird atlas, which is about 10 years ago. You can see there's a couple of dots up in, um, uh, up in Donegal. There's a, there's a big red dot there in, in Remelton, uh, which is nice to see. <laughs> um, but you can see the change in that. It's frightening. And that's 10 years ago. So there's no yes. reason. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, are they going to be redoing the atlas soon, Angus? It's normally every 20 years, so I would say it'll, it'll probably, because it's a mammoth task. It is a mammoth task in fairness. Um, but it is frightening. And it, it, look up Bird Atlas if you're interested in this kind of thing. Just Google Bird Atlas UK, uh, UK and Ireland, and you'll see um, it, all the maps are there are free. You'll have to uh, press a couple of buttons on the website to get them, but they're all free. They're all there, and you can compare everything. We hear a lot about the curlew. We hear about the corn crake. We hear about some of these iconic species. But you look, look at something as simple as a house sparrow or look at something like starlings. People often ask me, first time they notice starlings when they're nesting in the roof and they don't want them because of the droppings and the rest. And, but then you look at, compare a couple of these maps and people stop that discussion very quickly because you can see starlings, uh, their numbers are huge to drop. Same for so much. Anyway, um, without getting too doom and gloom, but yeah. it, it's, it's a good kind of indicator that's in it. That, that corn bunting, just to finish from doom and gloom, <laughs> corn bunting is gone. The corn bunting that was there uh, in my parents' time um, a bird very like the yellow hammer with similar kind of habits is now extinct in Ireland, um, which is a kind of sad, uh, sad thing. Now, I saw one of these guys yesterday, um, and they're just fantastic. I saw a big female sparrowhawk. Female sparrowhawks are about time and a half again as the males. The male is the one with the more reddish breast there. Um, and they think the reason for that is that in the winter time they won't rival each other. The male will go for blackbirds and smaller. Um, especially the smaller birds really and the female will go for blackbirds and bigger so females will take jackdaws and even things as big as wood pigeons um, I remember one catching a wood pigeon in my garden the girls were my, my two young girls were amazed by it um, just a couple of years ago 
And they are now, it used to be the kestrel was our most common bird of prey. Unfortunately, the, their numbers have dropped. However, the sparrowhawk is kind of doing okay. And it's our most common bird of prey now. And if you see something flashing along the edge of a hedge, um, they will fly along one edge and they will use a gate or a gap in the hedge. And because by flying on one edge, they'll push all the little birds over to the other side to try and get as far away from it. And then they'll flip over the hedge um, and dive in and grab one of the birds. And people think this can be terribly cruel and the rest. Uh, nature can be cruel. However, what they're doing is they're improving the gene pool all the time. Over 90%, so more than 9 out of 10 of their hunts uh, are unsuccessful for the poor old sparrowhawk. So mostly the birds get away, but the ones they do catch won't go on to breed next year. And they might be the birds that are a little bit slower or didn't see or didn't uh, react as well or whatever, which means the birds that then survive through the winter are the, the strongest, the wiliest and have the best chance for their, their offspring. Um, and just looking at some of the animals in the hedgerow, uh, I'll just quit, I'll, I won't linger on this because I'm just conscious of the time here, but um, it's so important um, for our hedgehogs as wildlife corridors mentioned at the very beginning for the lovely hares now the hares will quite often hang out in the middle of uh, of fields keeping away from the fox that will use the hedgerow but they'll also um, use the hedgerows for, for shelter and whatnot as well our badgers will often nest in the hedgerows especially some of the older hedgerows that have good ditches and the little pygmy shrew our smallest mammal um, which needs to eat every three hours. It needs to eat every three hours. Quite incredible. You think of a dark winter's night and they are constantly, constantly, constantly out there feeding. Um, and they're a hugely important prey item for owls, for kestrels, for other things as well, even for the badger if it comes across them uh, and the fox. And, and they're eating away at bugs, um, controlling the numbers of bugs all the time. None of those things would be able to thrive as successfully as they do without uh, the hedgerows there. So that's kind of important. And then one of my favorite subjects, which I won't linger on too long, but bats. Uh, how amazing are bats? They're just, just stunning creatures. We have nine species of bats in Ireland. None of them uh, affect us negatively in any way whatsoever. They don't get caught in your hair. They're not blind either. They don't uh, pass on diseases. They certainly don't suck blood or do any of that kind of thing. In Ireland, they don't do any of that stuff. All the Irish bats do is hunt bugs and many, many bugs, over 3,000 bugs each every night. And last night out in my garden, just as the midges were starting to appear, two bats started flitting around and circled and circled and circled above our heads for quite a while. It was lovely seeing this natural pest control. Uh, every bat, over 3,000 bugs, amazing. This crazy looking character of a bat here is called the long-eared bat, which uh, many people think there is probably an awful lot more of in our, or in Donegal than is recorded. They have been recorded in Donegal, but they're quite hard to pick up with uh, conventional bat detectors, uh, and they're, they're just, they're under surveyed really. Their ears are as long as their bodies, and they whisper, they don't shout like other bats, other bats can be picked up easier. Anyway, without hedges, those bats, they use those hedges as foraging lines, as commuting lines. Uh, some of you might be familiar from before, uh, from er early March when we were allowed or able to travel around the country, if you drove down that motorway, which um, goes down from, is it Tume, I think, down as far as Ennis and, and, and keep going off down to Limerick, and um, there's a bridge across that, or if you find yourself on that again the next few months, look out for the bridge. And that bridge was there thanks to an environmental assessment which found that there was bats and they t the bats tend to use the same commuting lines and they're going from hunting ground to hunting ground or, or wherever. Um, so that bridge was put in place to keep um, continuous hedgerow because putting in something like a motorway is very handy from getting from A to B, but my goodness, it just cuts a big slice right through all those habitats. Uh, so it's, it was wonderful to see. Now, it's only one bridge. You could do a lot more of them, but it's wonderful to see us starting to think that way. I'm not aware of any other bridges like that um, anywhere else in, in Ireland. And uh, Ingus, there's plenty of opportunities for people to get involved with bat monitoring, isn't there? There's loads, yes. Yeah. So go on to Bat Conservation Ireland. Uh, they're a wonderful organisation. Last year, I think it was, they launched a new website, which is super. They have all sorts of great games and educational stuff for children, so it's, it's very family friendly. Um, and there's various different bat surveys. There's uh, the Bat Atlas, 
just pretty much finishing up now, there's the, what's called the De Benton's bat survey. There's water bats, the ones that skim over the water. A lot of us will have seen them. Um, and you can do a really easy survey. They'll even lend you a bat detector uh, and you have to do two surveys in the August. It's a terribly easy and simple thing to do. They'll train you for free and all the rest. And it's great fun. And I've got to say, I love doing the surveys. The reason I love doing surveys is because it forces me. It stops me being lazy. <laughs> so in the evening time where I might be thinking, I'll just put on Netflix now, I've had enough of all this. If I've signed up to a survey, I have to do it. And never once going out to do a survey have I regretted it. You always, you know yourself, you always enjoy it, but sometimes it's nice to have the, the motivation. So you can very much get involved with that. Okay, um, well, we're getting a couple of questions in, um, oh. Angus, but uh, we, what we might do is leave that. I know Margaret's just come in there with a the question as well. So we'll just leave it because we're, you're nearly at the end of your presentation, so we'll just wait for the questions there for a few moments, okay? Yeah, perfect. Uh, I, yeah, I'll wrap up just with these last couple of slides. One thing that, um, this was just taken from Google Street View in Carn Donna, and you can see that funny looking roundy green plant down the bottom of the hedge, uh, invasive species. And we all know the dangers of invasive species. I think at this stage we've heard, especially we've heard about Japanese knotweed, but there's many of them that are invasive and they do exactly what, is, what, they, what they say, they just take over. So those primroses and celandines that were uh, a few slides ago, they won't be in that hedge. All of that cow parsley that's there at the moment and the various different grasses that so many bugs rely on, they won't be there. Same with the knapweeds and the other things, the meadow sweets that'll come up later in the summer, not there um, because this, this one thing has invaded. So good hedgerow man management also means, and this goes for us uh, that own our gardens or whatever else, this doesn't, it, you don't have to be a big landowner for this at all. We can all be responsible for it. We need to look at uh, invasive species and we need to look at getting rid of them. Um, yeah, um, just Angus, just on that point there, and it relates to what Margaret has asked us there. It's about um, cutting the hedges, um, you know, doing it every year. And then you might end up with gap hedges, people cutting them too close um, to the, the bottom of the hedge. So um, do you think that farmers should be incentivized for gap hedges? I want to ask the people this one first. So I think Karen has a poll on this as well, Karen. Um, so do you think that farmers should be incentivized to repair a gappy hedge? We talked about gappy hedges earlier um, and you mentioned it and you showed us um, an, a good example and you said that 50%, uh, was it 50% of Donegal hedges are considered gappy yeah. and that this was an issue. So do people think that maybe we should ask the landowners um, to replant the gappy hedges and should they be incentivized to do so? That could be a tricky question because there's a lot of incentives out there for the farmers. So um, is this something we should be incentivizing them to do or should we be asking them to do different things that might help to um, for the hedge to replenish itself at the base? So we'll see what comes through on that yeah. one. Do we have any responses, Karen? Yeah, we have 11 of 12. So that's a really good um, number. I'll just end the poll and share the results for you, Trish. Great. Okay, 91%. That's, that's quite high there, Angus. So how, what, what would you think about that? I, well, I'll tell you, I'll move on to the next slide, actually, and, uh, and discuss it there, because you can see this is Himalayan knotweed, a similar kind of thing to Japanese knotweed. It, ju it just takes over and it outcompetes. In its right place, uh, it has its own biological controls, its natural biological controls. Here, it just doesn't. Uh, and as a result, all of the other things that should be growing in that picture are not. Uh, and it'll keep spreading if it's not taken in check. Um, but have a look at this. So the, uh, this was only launched, was it last week? Was the week before? Anyway, a few days ago. Um, the EU 2030 Biodiversity Strategy, it still needs to be voted on, but it was launched by the Commission, still needs to be voted on by the European Parliament. Um, but it's very ambitious. It looks at wanting to put 30% of land um, uh, managing 30% of land with stricter protections and uh, same, uh, same for our seas 
and then they want 10% of all farmland to be uh, managed directly for biodiversity in a very biodiverse positive way. And they also talk about incentivizing. And I think the fact, this is just my own opinion, but I think the fact that there's already incentives there, and um, we already, the system we have in Ireland, we've had for a long time across Europe, is that we, we pay farmers to do various things. This gives an amazing opportunity to be able to do in conjunction with the farmers, with the landowners, it has to, if they don't buy in, the whole thing's a waste of time. Um, but uh, we need to come up with, in fact, we don't even need to come up, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but we need to roll out systems that can allow people farm in ways that they want to farm, but also to be able to mitigate against any kind of potential damage that their farming might be doing and to be able to encourage biodiversity. And I really believe strongly that we need to, uh, those payments, we need to redirect a lot of payments to help people uh, encourage biodiversity. And an awful lot of farm owners and landowners that I talk to um, would agree with that and would want to see that. But have a look at the EU 2030 biodiversity strategy. You'll see the email address down there. Um, you can punch in and it just gives a little simple synopsis without having to get into the nitty gritty of the document. Uh, it's very ambitious. It's very ambitious. And for Ireland in particular, it would mean an awful lot of change. Uh, I think it's 25% of uh, farmland they want to become organic, organic farmland in Ireland, which would be wonderful for biodiversity. Uh, at the moment, we're about the lowest organic farming uh, ratio in all of Europe. Um, and quite often there might be a lot of opposition to organic farming from some sectors, um, but it's quite normal in other parts of Europe. So we're a bit of an outlier there. Uh, and it's a good thing to remember if you hear people talking it down or, or not agreeing with it. Um, only 2% or a little over 2% of Irish farms are organic. Um, but this is a fantastic project. It's called the Bride Project. Uh, and it's going on at the moment. And the reason I say, or I said a moment ago, we don't need to come up with ways of managing land. We just need to incentivize. For the last at least 10 years, there's been all sorts of different schemes trying out helping biodiversity, trying getting farmers to help with biodiversity, incentivize schemes on all sorts of difference. But it doesn't matter if it's an area covered in rushes, if it's an upland, a boggy, heathy upland, it doesn't matter if it's a dairy rich land um, or land that's very good for dairy. But we have all these templates. We don't need to try any more. We don't need new pilot programs. We just need uh, the powers that be to put the money towards the likes of this Bride Project. So the Bride Project uh, goes on down in Cork. They are all dairy farmers. They are all, um, uh, they get pretty high yield. It's all fairly intensive farming. However, they've given over 10% of their land um, to sign up to this project. They get an ecologist that comes along, which is paid for, so it doesn't cost them anything. And quite often, a lot of the land that they have, the hedges and whatnot, they, they won't have to give all, of, um, all that much extra land. Their uh, biodiversity is checked, and then a plan has come up with, with how they can improve it, if they need to improve some gappy hedges, if they maybe need to change some of the wetlands or, or some of the swampy areas that they have. Uh, and this is something they've done really successful in the Bride Project. And when you talk to the guys managing this, they say that they have about 60 people, I think, on it, or maybe 56, which is the maximum the funding allows, but they say they have another 60 waiting to come in. Um, one of the lovely things about this is it doesn't punish. So it's not threatening anybody's existence. It's not threatening any farm payments. It's purely, uh, it, if you want to do it, great, up you come. The more you do, the more you get paid. The more you follow the program, the more you get paid. And if you don't follow the program, you feel it's not for you, you're asked, well, listen, would you mind stepping aside, please? Because there's loads of others that do want to. And there isn't people stepping aside from it. So this, it shows that we can do, with, with our current uh, systems here, we can do an awful lot more for biodiversity immediately. Um, right now, so it kind of it shows that there. Uh, the last slides that I have here is just to show a couple of extra little things that you can do. If you go Google the Hedgerow Survey of County Donegal, uh, it's a very comprehensive and a fairly heavy document. However, there's some brilliant tables in it which will give you a very quick snapshot of what our hedges are like, uh, the different kind of species and the rest of it. And then the pollinator plan from the uh, excellent National Biodiversity Data Center. Um, have lots of great how-to guides, and one of them is how to um, help pollinators with hedgerows, how to manage that. And all of this stuff is free, it's all on the internet, and you can just download them as little PDFs. Uh, and they're, they're, especially that how-to guide is a very accessible thing. Okay, that's brilliant, Angus. Thank you so much for that. Um, a lot of food for thought there. Um, just before you finish up, would you have three top tips for 
um, for farmers or landowners who, or just anybody who has a hedge and how they can maintain it? What would be your top three? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think one of the very first things to do, and with nearly 50% of our hedges being gappy, um, so we still have a lot of hedgerows in, in Donegal. So an awful lot of Donegal farmers, they don't want to chop down those hedgerows. And we can see from driving around that clear that they're not removing them purposely. Um, however, uh, they need to maintain them, or in, in a lot of cases, they need to be maintained better uh, at the bottom, starting from the bottom up. So to give it as much space as is possible to allow things um, to grow along the bottom, the margins. And of course, this has all sorts of, uh, of benefits. There is um, some arable farmers in Leinster and there's a grey partridge reintroduction programme and they were asked to, uh, to leave a margin of a couple of metres all around the edge of their field. Now that can sound like quite a lot of land when you add it all up. Um, what they found in the end, now I remember one farmer in particular talked about it and he was quite sceptical about it. He said, this is, I'm going to lose a pile of money, I'm not going to be able to plant this with crops. Um, that couple of metre strip around the edge allows the partridges to survive in there but also a whole load of other biodiversity came. So as well as getting paid for, to manage that little strip of land, so he's pleased with that payment, he also um, has natural pest control. So he now doesn't have to use as much pest control on his crops. So he's saving money on that as well. So they're saving in ways that they didn't realize and the Partridge Programme didn't really think would actually have a benefit. So it tends to benefit uh, in all sorts of different ways. So the first tip would be leave the bottoms alone, let stuff thrive and grow in the bottom. The second thing I would say is um, try and let them grow nice and tall, try and get, let them get up to that three metres or more and cut them in that A-frame way. Uh, in other words, leaving the bottom wider and cutting in a little bit and don't cut them every year. Don't cut the same side or don't cut both sides every year. So you're allowing a good spread. It's easy to do because they're cutting them anyway, they're managing them to some extent anyway, so it's just a matter of putting the same kind of time in, but using it in a slightly different way. And then the third thing is um, look for advice. There's tons out there. Chagas have some great documents, the Heritage Council of great documents, and the likes of the National Biodiversity Data Centre, plus there's so many different schemes there. If you do have a gappy hedge, uh, find out how it can be improved. There's various methods of laying, there's ways that you can plant for the right kind of plants and all the rest of it. Um, right, brilliant. Loads of advice there to um, Ingus as well from you. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to open it up now to um, everybody here today. If anybody wants to ask a question, you could um, put your question into the chat there for us. Or um, if you wanted to, um, you could maybe put your hand up, put a H or something into the chat box and we'll give you the opportunity to actually um, ask your question directly to Ingus. So has anybody any questions out there? I, I think I've asked quite a few already. So um, anybody there with any questions? Trish, if, if, if um, everybody turns on their video now, um, then we can actually see people. There are some questions in the chat function already. Yes, yeah, so there, there's one there from Kate. Yeah, I, mean, I, was, I was just wondering, um, uh, you know, because quite often, you know, we would see hedge cutting uh, happening in, in those times, you know, maybe kind of before, uh, like during the summer, or in the spring and summer, but within the times when it's not supposed to happen. And I kind of often wonder, well, what, what is the recommended action there? I mean, are, are, are we supposed to report it? And who do you report it to? And it's not, I mean, not so much to be promoting like a kind of a, you know, a sort of a finger pointing exercise. But at the same time, if nothing is done and people just openly kind of flaunt the, 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 the rules or the laws, you know, then, then you kind of have to wonder like, well, how effective are they going to be really, you know? Um, is there any advice or, you know, or even thoughts? What, what do people think about that? Yeah, I do wonder. Well, yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, it's against the law. So, so it's illegal. Um, it's, uh, under the remit of the National Parks and Wildlife Service. So um, every area has, uh, has a ranger. So there's a few rangers in County Donegal, for instance, and there's not near enough of them, in my opinion. The National Parks uh, have been terribly underfunded uh, forever, but hopefully that will, will change as time goes on as we're getting more and more awareness of the need for this kind of thing. But they're effectively the nature police. Um, so you get on to them first and foremost, um, and they will... Um, 
uh, they will try and follow it up. If you're not getting any joy with that, or if you can't get them, ring the guards, tell the guards. They're breaking the law. The guards, uh, the, they're the, the guardians of the peace and guard of Shiakana. Um, so, and even though they mightn't do anything, they mightn't have the resources or they might feel it's the national parks, it'll be logged. And the more yeah. of this that goes in, the more it's logged, the more it builds up. Also, if you see people cutting on the roadside, don't be afraid to approach the council because the council will have commissioned a lot of people cutting on the roadside. Now, our hedges need to be kept safe um, for the most, uh, the most fanatical bird watcher uh, out there. They still want to get to their bird watching spot in a safe way uh, is the kind of way I think of it. So we do need a certain amount of management. However, sometimes that management, well, often that management goes way too far and people just... Uh, it, That's it, like, because a lot of the time, the, you know, the, the, the reason for road safety and... and have good, you know, good, so vehicles can see the roads and they're not, you know, that they're not blocking uh, view or sight, it, that that's the reason given. But quite often the, the cutting is quite extreme. Like, I mean, that kind of trashing um, cutting that they do, like, and you see it sometimes happening in July and you're just like, oh my gosh, what's, wh how, how is this happening, you know? How is yeah. this being allowed? Yeah. Yeah, and, and in, in some areas and corners and things like that, for lines of sight, it, it will need to be done. But it should be stopped there. And it, it's really important to stop it there. That awareness in the public is getting more and more and more. And the more the awareness builds in a nice kind of friendly way, as you say, without wagging fingers, none of us like to be told what to do. But the less people, I think, will do that kind of thing. But we need to log it. We need to talk about it. We need to ask people about it. Ask the council. The more questions are coming in, the more pressure they're going to be under. Plus, in fairness, the Donegal County Council, they signed up to the pollinator plan. So there's a whole template for them to be able to look and manage and guidelines. And a lot of this, people have been encouraged um, to maintain things in a certain way for decades. So it's hard. Um, change like that is very hard. Uh, so they need to be educated and brought along with the way. And signing up to that pollinator plan is a real um, indication, I think, that Donegal County Council wants to do that, which is super. Just to say as well, they've been very supportive in the Eco Carn project um, and very engaged. So I think that's a good opportunity as well to, to kind of highlight issues like this as well. Um, and they were looking at the, you know, not cutting the yes, some urges and stuff like a bit more. I think sometimes as well, it's a case of um, your maintenance regime when you do it. Some people have a mindset of I do it in the, the in May or June. I'll cut my hedges in June. Do it earlier in the year. Do it later in the year. Just try and and, and avoid um, the middle of the year really. So February is a great time. I cut my hedges in February. It's a great time to do it. And then if you need another trim again, you can do that in October, November. So it's just about getting people into a habit of doing it at different times of the year as well, and to consider what you're doing. But Angus is right. I mean, if if you do see something like that, do consider. You know who it is. I mean, if it is the council, um, they're probably doing it for for um, road um, sight lines and things like that. But you know, there, it just depends. So you just need to judge um, what seems to be happening at that time. Right. Okay. Any other questions for us? Um, there's a question here from Margaret. Will Angus will give you this one? Um, why do farmers do such severe head cutting? And this is not just on the roads then, this is within the fields. Um, is it to save time while doing it or to save having to do it every year? Margaret, do you want to add anything to that? I remember many years ago, must be about 20 years ago, um, in a heritage group in Clonani, um, some of you will know good old Marius Harkin suggesting that hedgerows were part of our natural heritage and we should care for them. And there was just like a tsunami of eye rolling like oh shut up you know like it's we haven't time for this nonsense so i just wonder do we know why there's such a um it's not a cavalier but it's a kind of a it's, a, it's like just get it done you know cut it the hell down get it over with and we don't have time in the farming calendar you know to be spending time on it and i wonder has that changed or do we know why what are farmers priorities when they do such severe hedge cutting now that's a long time ago, so they might have changed in the meantime, I don't know. Some have, and some certainly manage them a lot better, and some haven't. Um, and equipment has got all the more efficient, is one word, <laughs> um, with it. 
there is a legacy to this in Britain after the Second World War. Um, there was a big movement to encourage removal of hedgerows altogether to make fields bigger, to be more uh, self-reliant on their own food and whatnot. And we followed a kind of similar idea of making fields bigger and bigger and removing hedges. And it's not terribly long ago that that was still being encouraged. So for uh, for a lot of people, that that's kind of that's in set and that's that was the perceived wisdom back in the day. Now it's all changing. Um, I think a big problem is quite often the change uh, or the advice or the recommend or whatever you want to call it comes from uh, doesn't necessarily come from the right channels. So there might be conservation groups or local groups are saying this needs to be saved, but then there might be other. Uh, other groups saying, well, that's actually not necessarily so. I think once, when and if, and I think it'll be more when than if, um, uh, the carbon value can be calculated for hedgerows. Suddenly, for those that aren't getting it, they will suddenly start seeing a really big value uh, in hedgerows. Um, but it needs to be pushed more from the department. Don't be afraid to politicize it as well, by the way. The more our councillors, the more our TDs hear about it. Um, You've got to remember, without wagging fingers at anybody, but it was the same year that uh, uh, the government declared a national climate change and national biodiversity crisis. A couple of months later, they passed, or forced through really, because it, it met all sorts of opposition in the Senate and the rest of it, um, they pushed through the bill to try and uh, reduce the protections for our, uh, for our heritage, including hedgerows, which, which is two different things. So the more they hear about it, they will react to what people kind of want. Um, I think that that's a huge part of it. Um, uh, just to bring in there, I can see somebody in the room with us here um, who's working on um, our Uplands EIP project within Inishon. I'm not sure if um, many of you have heard about this, but um, it's, this is um, an, a European innovation project which was funded um, to get farmers engaged into, um, well, it's about farming income, but it also includes elements of water and biodiversity. And um, Henry's with us. So Henry, if you just wanna, cause it's, it's a little bit similar to the Bride Project as well. You know, some of the things that you're doing um, would, would work for you, for us up here in Inishon, the Inishon farmers that you have. Do you give us a couple of comments of how you feel about the hedgerows? Yeah, well, basically what we're trying to do uh, is to educate farmers that there's there, there's actually financial and economic reasons for managing hedges and trees on the farm, because a proper hedge or trees can in, uh, <coughs> lengthen the grazing season, uh, it can shelter animals, it can prevent the spread of disease, it can capture nutrients that might flow onto a water course. Uh, there, there's huge benefits to, to trees and hedges on the farm. And really farmers haven't even contemplated a lot of this at this stage. So we're starting off a project to, to get farmers to actually start to think about this and to see the benefits of, of all hedges and trees on the farm. Uh, again, relating it back to actually money in their pocket. Uh, it, it's not... And it has the added benefits of improving biodiversity and improving water quality and reducing emissions and a whole range of things. But at the end of the day, just on a very practical level, we're putting it across to farmers. If you strategically plant trees or a hedge, they serve a very valid purpose for your farming system, for your existing livestock. And we really want to start that conversation that, uh, there, there's much more to this uh, in, in different facets. And it does deliver a huge amount of public goods uh, as, as a byproduct, if you like. So like we're, we're encouraging farmers uh, to plant new hedges, but maybe not just what has happened up to now. Farmers have been incentivized to plant a hedge and they just take the path of least resistance and plant a hedge somewhere, oh, well, that's handy, and it's easy done there. Whereas what we're saying to them, start to think about planting hedge where you're actually going to get an economic return from it and, and, and to try and start that conversation. The same with, with trees. Uh, people assume, right, trees or forestry, uh, that you're, you're going to harvest timber. Uh, that's a long-term objective, but there's a lot of other benefits to having trees on the farm as well. And we had a bit of a battle with the Department of Agriculture because a lot of the stuff on 
biodiverse areas or hedges or areas planted in trees, the Department of Agriculture are telling farmers, oh, that's not eligible for your payments now. And, and really, it, it's incredible that they're still actually saying that in this day and age. But uh, hopefully, we're, part of our project is to engage with the department and show them this area is giving huge benefits uh, to the local community, to the environment and everything else. It, it probably should be getting more payments from the EU rather than you saying it's ineligible for payments simply because a, an animal or you can't cut silage of it or it's not a green field, which is our, our perception of eligibility. So uh, it, it's opened up a lot of uh, discussion on that as well. And even then, if, if you want to move actually from the hedgerow or from the trees, the actual fields themselves, part of our project is to get farmers to look beyond what they have been advised for the last 30 years, which is to establish a monoculture of, of perennial ryegrass. What we're trying to get farmers to do, what they are doing and then shown is they're establishing herbal lays, uh, diverse swords, which have loads of, of clovers, which fix, fix nitrogen. So they're not running to any shown co-op to buy huge quantities of nitrogen fertilizer, which ends up in the river. So we're, we're taking a full whole farm approach. There, there's so much can be done. And again, the economics of doing this actually add up as well. And, and that's what we're emphasizing to farmers. So I'm sorry to go on too long, Trish, but uh, uh, I, I just, we like to get it the opportunity good. to get the message of what we're trying to do out. Yes, well, it's fantastic that this is happening in a show because there's loads of lessons that are going to be learned there. And, you know, we can look to the bride and we can look to, you know, some of the other upland projects down in Wicklow or, or in Wales. And, and um, I know you had a, a talk by somebody from, I think it was Valley Castle, and he was encouraging widening the margins, the uncut margins around the hedgerows and showing that that had a, had a benefit. Um, to the fields itself, you know, you didn't have to cut right up to the hedge. And that's what, what we're talking about in terms of gappy hedges. You know, if you leave that margin there, will the gaps fill in themselves? Would that solve that gappy hedge problem, do you think, Angus? Well, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, it, no, I, I think uh, it depends on, on how far it's gone, but I think it, it'll either need laying or planting uh, if they're as gappy as quite often as they are. Uh, however, it, it will certainly help. But um, uh, for that kind of maintenance, you need to be able to access it uh, uh, and all the rest. So that is something I think that perhaps would need to be done first. Um, but yeah, Henry, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, uh, it's back to management. What farmers have sort of done up to now is it's back to what somebody was saying about the severe cutting. Uh, there's this perception, oh, that's nice and neat. <laughs> and it's really to educate farmers that, that this short back and sides neat thing, it's, it's not neat. It's not delivering anything. It's actually totally useless. Uh, but it's just the perception of what is neat. And uh, that, that perception needs to be broken. And hedges, the need to be managed, but farmers' perceptions up to now of managing them as the short back and sides. Uh, it, management is, is much more, it's, it's not that for a start, it, it's much different. And, and, and really, there's a huge education process to be done there. And the, the hedge has to be managed. There's loads of ways of thickening up hedges, depending on the age of it and, and what type of hedge it is and everything. But uh, that, that, that skill set just isn't really there in the farming community yet. And uh, the, the perception has been, or what farmers have really been advised this last 20 or 30 years, oh, just cut it and that's it nice and neat. Whereas really we need to go beyond that. And even the Department of Agriculture has incentivized quite a bit of new hedges over the last 10 or 15 years. But they didn't really think about, right, what do you, do you get paid to establish it? What, what's the next stage? Because it's all about stages according to the life cycle of the hedge. And that, that hasn't even been explored yet by the Department of Agriculture. So hopefully we're hoping to have some input into that as well. It's not a case of plant a new hedge and forget about it or run a hedge cutter on it. Uh, we need to open up that whole uh, conversation as to what needs to be done. Yeah, I think uh, there are lessons for everybody here. I mean, it's not just farmers. Um, landowners, but there are other groups like um, Teddy Towns groups or 
um, some groups that might be working in a particular area, um, for the council itself, for, uh, for everybody that we can all pick up little bits of information about what is the best thing to do. And as you say, there are some bits of the science that we don't quite understand yet. And so we will be learning more as we go on. Have we any other burning questions before we go? Because um, I'm conscious that um, our time is running on. We've only got five minutes left. So we've, um, Finbar has a question. So um, if you unmute yourself there, Finbar, and go ahead. Just, um, yeah, hi, no, great, great talk. Just one very quick question. Should trees like accidental trees so to speak like you know ash trees and sigmars be encouraged sporadically to grow in in hedgerows you know or would this uh does this create the gaps should they be you know because i remember one time coming across a hedgerow and someone tied a little plastic bag or something on a little sapling that was emerging up and Whoever was cutting the hedge, you know, said, well, this person wants this, this little tree to grow into a mature tree. And I thought it was a, a nice idea. And I'm just wondering, is it, would you encourage this as a generally, you know? Yeah, I, I certainly would occasional. Now, if there's too much and it starts to get continuous cover, that's going to change the structure and change. Yeah. So not uh, as many things are going to be able to do as well underneath, but absolutely. Um, occasionally some trees should be allowed to uh, grow and mature and can do very well and you'll often see that in hedges um, where some are allowed to go up um, and, but preferably the native species the beech the haw or the beech and the sycamore are quite often the ones that um, uh, do well and are sent flying and you're better to leave an oak or, or perhaps an ash or something do need to be a little bit conscious of roadside if it's going to get very big if ivy is going to go on it and there's going to be extra weight so kind of from a safety point of view um, ash can tend to shed branches a little bit, that kind of thing. Uh, but if it's possible and safe, it, yeah, I think it's a very good thing. Thank you. Okay, that's great, everyone. So um, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Angus. That was really, really interesting. I certainly learned um, something new there too. So I'll pass you back to um, Denise now, who will wrap up for us. Okay, uh, thank you both. Uh, it was great, Angus, um, and, and your interjections uh, to Trish and, and Henry. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a good knowledge around the table, so to speak. Um, I suppose just to say again um, that this is part of the Eco Carn project, which is um, looking at developing a, a, a doing an audit for the, the Carn donor area and create an action plan. So all of this is really good information to have to hand for, for the community. Um, and again, it's funded to, through the Community Foundation for Ireland. Um, Karen has one last quick poll, I think, for us just to finish off with um, in terms of looking ahead. And uh, we'll just pop that up now, Karen, and, and then we can finish up. Okay, so I'm conscious, Denise, you probably can't see this. So the, the question is, has the, the talk informed your thinking around the role and value of hedgerows? Uh, there's four answers or four possible answers to that. Uh, then will the information you heard today uh, influence how you maintain or look after your hedge? So we have a four of nine voted so far. Seven of nine. And those are that are on a phone. If you scroll to the right, your poll pops up, I think on the, your, your, one of your future pages. Okay. So we've seven of nine. Um, we're happy to end that, Denise. Yeah. And we'll just share the results. Okay, so um, uh, has the, this talk informed your thinking around the role of, and value of hedgerows? Um, 57 joints said yes, it, and it reinforces what I already knew. And yes, I have learned something new, which is really great. Um, and then for the second question, will you will the information you heard today influence how you maintain or look after your hedge? And there's a hundred percent yes in that. Great. So just to say thanks again to Angus um, for a really informative talk and, and nicely presented in terms of good visuals as well. Sometimes there's so much information coming out. It's nice to have that mix of visuals and engagement and the polls broke it up. So a big thank you to Trish as well and Inishon Rivers Trust who are, are working with EcoCarn to, um, I suppose, not just do the audit, but raise awareness in the local community. 
Um, thanks to Karen for all the tech support um, as well. Uh, these things are always a wee bit precarious when you go online as to how they're going to operate. Um, but uh, if you're interested in what Eco Karen are doing, you can get in touch. Uh, we have a Facebook page. Um, or you can contact myself through Initial Development Partnership um, and we'll share out the information through uh, email. Thanks again for coming and uh, good to see you all and enjoy the sunshine. Okay, thank you. Thank Goodbye. you.